you've never got to meet and talk with uh, Margaret Sanders, you need to do that. It's a treat. She was in the last service uh, earlier, and uh, uh, God has used her over the last about 20-some years here at Bellevue since she came to faith in Christ uh, years ago back at our old campus. So, um, well, today we're going to continue this series called God Stories, and we're going to do so by talking about uh, uh, sharing our faith, you know. Uh, you, we're not going to see God stories in people's lives unless we share Christ with people's lives. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk to us about uh, sharing your faith. And uh, my message today is, uh, yeah, is, is get life, give life. And I really want to challenge us to be people who share our faith. Now, hey, I know that uh, for, for a lot of you, as soon as I start talking about evangelism, as soon as I start talking about sharing your faith with other people, um, and especially here on this Memorial Day weekend, why a lot of you all got, you got vacation on the brain and uh, time off and all that stuff, you begin to shut down on me. I know that, that whenever a pastor comes and talks about how everybody needs to share their faith and have, engage in evangelism, people start shutting down. Start arguing th in, the, in their own mind, saying, you know, I can't share my faith. I'm not very good at that. I'm going to leave that up to somebody else. But boy, these preachers, they always come and they make a really good case about how the scriptures say that we need to all share our faith. And I know that that's probably true, but I, have, I need to start rationalizing right now about why that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> and you start thinking in your mind. And, uh, and the, the thing is, is uh, it would be a shame if you didn't really listen to my message but instead you just started throwing up roadblocks in your own mind uh, about that message, uh, about how it doesn't apply to you. I'd like you to, to hear me out and take a look at the ministry of Christ and see how God really does show us how he wants us to be carriers of the gospel to people around us and how that can not only transform their lives and our lives, but, but God, God can... Can, can change us in the process and bring us right into the heart and soul of what he's about in this, in this world. And so if you would, take your Bibles and turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4. The Gospel of John, chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, take one of the Bibles in the seat rack in front of you and look at the Gospel of John, chapter 4. We're going to look at a day in the life of Jesus, and we're going to see how he interacts with this one particular woman and in doing so, how he shows us how we can share our faith in a way that results in God stories in people's lives. And the Bible says in verse 4 of chapter 4 of the Gospel of John, it says, Now he, that's Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well, or Jacob's well, rather, was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that gives you a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to her, Sir, said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when, when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. 
Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Skip down to verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. And we're talking today about how we share Christ with those who need Jesus. You know, if we're going to share Christ with those who, who need Jesus, we need to first get our minds wrapped around the problem, the real problem that we're seeking to address. And that problem is this. People need God's life. People need God's life. In this passage, Jesus offers this woman living water. And of course, it's a metaphor for the fact that what they really need, what she really needs, is the life of God. She needs the life of the Spirit of God in her life. And and why would he say this? Why would he use this metaphor of water for the life that he was offering? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Because water equals life. Water equals life. Water is foundational to our lives. Our bodies, if you didn't already know this, consist of 65% water. Water is the dominant ingredient in our blood, and water fills each of our millions of cells. I mean, though loaded with millions and millions of nerve cells, our brains are 78% water. So if you've been wondering what was sloshing around in there, it's water. Uh, we, can, we can survive for, for protracted, protracted periods of times without food, but we can only survive a few days apart from water. Now, over the years that I've been pastor here at Bellevue, uh, we've had a few staff members um, on our staff that have, have fasted from solid food for as much as 40 days. I've had two staff members that, that have done that. I've never done that. I have fasted for as much as eight days, about Three and a half years ago, in January, fasted for eight days. And you can not only fast from solid food for a protracted period of time, uh, to some extent, um, and uh, survive, you can actually even thrive in that time. But you cannot live without water. You go a few days, just a few days without water, and you will die. And you'll be very, very sick even before you die. Water is life. This is pretty important for us to see that we need the life of God in us. Now, some people say, well, yeah, I need water. That doesn't mean I need the life of God in me. Oh, the life of God in you is the only thing that can give you any hope at all. I mean, you think about the fact of our our bodies, which are made of pretty much water, right, and dirt. In fact, if, if, if you died and we threw your carcass into the field, it wouldn't take long for the birds of the air to come and start picking at you and, uh, and, and the worms of the ground come up and start breaking your body down. And over time, you'd get to a point where all you were was, uh, was the dirt in the field again. And uh, you'd just go back to dirt, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That's who we are. We're dust and we're dirt and water. But what constitutes us? What holds us together? It is nothing short from the breath of God. 
The only thing that holds you together right now is the will of God and the breath of God. If God lifted his will for you to be alive up from you, if he drew his breath out from you, then you would collapse and you would be the dust of the ground, period. And maybe a little bit of a few wet spots too since it's water, right? We're nothing short of a bag of mud apart from the breath and will of God. And so don't tell me that you don't need God's life. We, the only way we can have eternal life is for God to give it. And the one thing that separates us from life is sin. And the Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so we deserve death and condemnation and hell for our sin. It separates us from God and his life. We are dead in our sins apart from some work of God. And God says in Christ, he says, I am life. I am living water to you. I am your life. You need to be connected to me. Jesus was able to say that because Jesus had died on the cross for us. He had risen from the dead for us. He, 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 he was going to be doing that, and uh, he has done it, but he was going to be doing it when he was speaking to this woman. He was on the way to doing that, and we, we, what we know is that he had the authority to say, I am God's life for you, and I am here. You ask me for living water, I can give you living water. I can give you life. And so... People need God's life. That's the problem. We, oh, we, we live in a world where people need the life of God. But the principle is this. If, we're to, if Christ is our source of life, if he's the one that brings us back into connection with life, then the reality is we need to be giving that life to other people. We need to be pointing people to Jesus. But here's the principle that ought to rule that. You can only give if you have life. You can only give life if you have life. You can't offer Christ to somebody else in any authentic way unless you have Christ in your life. And yet it's a very natural thing for you to share the good news of Jesus with other people when you're truly gripped by the good news of Jesus in your life. And so the only way you can give life is to get, to get life, to have life in Christ. And Jesus is saying this to this woman here who will, in just a little bit, start sharing the, the, the truth of Christ with her village. You see, Jesus wants you to find life in him. If you would, look at chapter 7 of John, verse 37 and, uh, th through 39. Jesus is at a great feast of the Jews in Jerusalem. And there's a high moment in this feast where he stands up and he makes a proclamation. And all this will become very clear, the significance of it, in just a few moments. But in verse 37, it says, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. But this, by this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Here Jesus distinctly says, listen, you want to have the water of life? You come to me and drink. Come to drink in, and, and you will find in me the life of God that you need to have eternal life. And so Jesus is saying this. It's interesting when he's saying it. He's in Jerusalem, he's on the seventh day of this incredible feast that's rich with significance, and we don't have time to get into every bit of that, but let me describe something that happened ritualistically in this great feast of the Jews there in Jerusalem during that week. Each day of the feast witnessed a water ceremony in which a procession of priests descended to the south border of the city to the Gihon Spring, and there a priest with a golden pitcher, it was quite impressive, uh, was there. He filled the golden pitcher with the water from that spring as a choir who surrounded him chanted Isaiah 12, verse 3, uh, which says, with joy, will, uh, with, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The water in that golden 
uh, pitcher was then carried back up the hill to the water gate, followed by crowds. And when the procession arrived at the temple, the priest would climb the altar steps and pour the water onto the altar of sacrifice while the circle, uh, or rather the crowd circled him and continued singing from Isaiah. And on the seventh day of the festival, this procession took place seven times. It happened seven times on that day. And Zechariah and Ezekiel, the great prophets, wrote in their books of visions of rivers flowing from the temple in a miraculous display of God's blessing. And this was to uh, uh, be a ritual expression of that prophetic vision that, that the life of God was going to pour forth from the altar of sacrifice in the temple. And that where God provides the sacrifice for sin, so the life of God flows out to humanity to give him life eternally. And in a drought-stricken land like Israel, it was a spectacular vision during this ceremony of life-giving water flowing from God's life-giving temple. And on this final day of celebration, Jesus, at this moment, steps into public view and he makes this most stunning pronouncement of the, at, at the, of the feast. As seven water processions are climbing the steep hill of South Jerusalem, he stands up and proclaims, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And the entire point is this. We need Jesus just like we need water. In Jesus, we have life. We have life that springs forth into eternal life. And we need to have living water, but we must also lead others to living water. Just as we would go out of our way to deliver water to parched people in the midst of a drought, so God wants us to share the life of Jesus with others that will connect them to the life of God that will last for all eternity. And you and I are meant to be those water carriers, to come to the spring of Christ and point people to the altar of God where they can drink from the well of life that is Jesus. But if we're going to share Jesus with somebody else, we've got to drink of Jesus ourselves. Where are you in your spiritual life? Are you someone that's never given your life to Christ, never turned from your sins and turned to Christ? My friends, I implore you, turn from your sins, turn to Christ, receive him as your Lord and Savior, and he will be living water to you forever. Maybe you're somebody here today, you've you accepted Christ, but you really have not been living in communion with him. Not, you've not really been leaning and depending on him. You've not really been growing in your love relationship with him. And I implore you, Come to him and say, Lord, I drink of you afresh and anew. I submit myself to you. I love you. I, I want to grow in my nurture and my adoration of you, that, that your life might be effervescent in my life, bubbling over in a way that attracts other people and, and makes them want to drink from you as well. Oh, that we would be those kind of people that the folks in our family and in our neighborhood and among our friends and our relatives and our friends at school and at work would, would want to, to know Jesus because we are knowing him and getting to know him more and experiencing the richness of life in him. See, your Christian life was never meant to be merely doctrinal, where you believe the right things, go to the right church, do the right rituals, and, uh, and, and, and continue in the religious pattern. All of those disciplines are fine. But what God wants more than anything in your life is for you to adore him, for your affections for him to grow, for, for it to be life-giving water to you, for you to pray and to seek his word and to experience him and share him with others. Oh, that there would be that kind of glory that you would experience because you live your life drinking in Jesus. I tell you what, the people that, that find it not intimidating to share their faith are the people who so drink in Jesus and live for Jesus that it's just natural for them. They ooze Christ everywhere. It's natural for them to share Jesus with others because they don't even think about it. They just want other people to experience what they're authentically enjoying. And you know the highest aim in your Christian life, the highest aim is for you to enjoy God. 
I mean, maybe there's some of you that needed to come here for, to hear one thing today, and that is that you were meant to enjoy God, to drink Him in. Have you ever been thirsty? I mean, really thirsty? I was in Virginia this week, and I was coming back, and uh, I had had barbecue uh, there at this place called Dickie's Barbecue. Some of you may have eaten there, and you may like it, so don't be offended by what I say. But... Um, you know, I, I grew up, or I didn't grow up, but in the last 17 and a half years, I've been in Owensboro. Now, a lot of other people think that they're the barbecue capital of the world, uh, but we know we are, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I tell you what, I, I'm accustomed to barbecue here. Well, I had barbecue there and uh, with some folks there uh, in Lynchburg, Virginia on, on Friday, and then I got in my car and I started driving home. Well, you can't get to Lynchburg. There's no interstates to Lynchburg. And uh, so you got to go through some country roads. And I was going through, a con- and it's in the mountains. So I was going to a country road, and I get car sick really easy. I know I keep interrupting my story, but I get car sick really easy. And so I'm driving in the mountains for 29 miles like this, and I just ate bad barbecue, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't get enough to drink. And so I was kind of a little dehydrated with bad barbecue in my stomach. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to upset your, there's no throw-up story in this. So, uh, so anyway, uh, so here I'm doing this, and I feel terrible. I got this headache, I feel nauseous, everything else. Finally, I get through those 29 miles, and I stop at a gas station, and I think, I got to get something to drink. And I got some water, and I got some Mountain Dew, because uh, I need a little bit of sugar in me. And, and I, I did that, and I drank the water. And as soon as I drank the water, it was like the headache started to dissipate and disappear. I started feeling better and feeling good and enjoying the rest of my day and my trip a lot more because it was a beautiful day. You know, when you really will drink in Jesus and say, I'm going to decide to enjoy Jesus, say, I'm going to enjoy Jesus today, Oh, I tell you what, you're going to feel so much better. And you know what, you, you, you're going to look at your, your friends at work or at school or your, your family members and you're going to say, you know, I want them to know this. See, the problem is so many of us Christians, we live such sour lives. We don't live in victory. We're not enjoying Jesus. We're just trying to follow rules, right, and, and to feel real bad when we break them. And we, we're so kind of we self-deprecating um, um, and, and we feel so torn up about our Christian life and we're looking at everybody else who's better at our Christian, their Christian life than at us and we're so defeated and everything else and, and we're just kind of running this Christian treadmill and we're miserable and then we look at our friends and we go, why would I want to subjugate them to this life? But if we would just enjoy Jesus, we'd look at our friends and our neighbors and we go, I want them to know what I know and have what I have because it's good. See, some of you, you need, you need to just come to the place where you say, you know what, I need to enjoy Jesus. I need to enjoy Jesus. Well, we see here that uh, God calls us to be water carriers to others and to lead them to faith. And so the problem, of course, is people need God. Uh, the principle is uh, we, uh, we need to have God to give God. But the prescription is to share Christ. And how do you share Christ? Well, uh, to offer life, to offer the life of Christ to somebody else, there's some things you have to do, and I'm gonna quickly go through these. A, you need to cross some comfort zones. Hear me out here. You gotta cross some comfort zones. In verse four, uh, Jesus, the Bible says, had to go through Samaria. In order to get where he was going, he had to go through Samaria. And this is a big deal. You need to understand, Samaria was this kind of, in the eyes of most Jews, was this blight on the Holy Land. It was because of the exile, and uh, there's a lot of history that I don't have time to get into. Basically, a pocket of people formulated there in that region that were considered half-breeds racially. Um, They they were uh, kind of some leftover Jews from the exile that had breeded with the, uh, the pagan people, and uh, the fact that they were half-breeds racially is not really that big of an issue. The more important thing is that they were half-breeds in terms of their religion. They had adopted some of the uh, pagan practices along with the, uh, the, the Jewish traditions, and they had this, this kind of conglomerate of error 
and uh, wrong belief in God. And uh, they, ju they just didn't worship God right and according to God's revelation. And because of that, Jews who were trying to stay pure in their religion uh, wouldn't have anything to do with Samaritans. And so they had created this whole cultural expectation. You don't talk to them, you, don't, you, don't, you disdain them. Um, you walk, if you walk through their property or their, their, their land, you, know, you shake the dust off your feet when you get to the other side. And so, but the Bible says that Jesus had to go through Samaria, and no doubt because of the route he was on. But he goes through and he talks to this woman. It's surprisingly, surprising that he even talks to this woman because it would be odd for somebody like him to even engage in a woman alone and, and to talk with her. But she's a Samaritan woman, this half-breed, and that's really shocking in his day. What did he do? He crossed some, some comfort zones to, to share uh, the, the living water of God with this person. And you know what? We are gonna need to cross some comfort zones. I once met a lady, a Christian lady, who said sometimes when she's walking in town, she sees someone that's different than her, and that makes her uncomfortable because of their social standing or their religion or their race. And she believed it was God's will for her to avoid that person because of her discomfort. That's it's insane. It's unrighteous. The fact is, is who would come to Christ if we didn't cross some comfort zones? There were people that crossed some comfort zones so that you could get the gospel. I bet you anything, we could go through our story and there was somebody who was nervous about sharing Christ with you but crossed their comfort zone and did. Or there were some people who crossed some comfort zones in their life in order to be more sacrificial to provide something that ended up resulting in you experiencing the gospel. Listen, you gotta cross some comfort zones if you're gonna bring life to somebody. Some of you, even in sharing Christ with your kids, you're nervous and you're uncomfortable. You think you're gonna mess it up to share what you know about Jesus with your kids, so you don't. Why? Cross the comfort zone. You say, well, I'm not used to praying out loud in front of my kids. Well, buck up and do it. Who cares? I'm uncomfortable about tons of what I do in life. And we wouldn't accomplish anything. Would you get promoted in your job if you didn't cross some comfort zones once in a while and do things? Would you even go to work if, 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 uh, if you didn't feel like you, uh, you know, if you felt enslaved to comfort? There's all kinds of things that you wouldn't do. Uh, you couldn't accomplish without crossing comfort zones. We've gotta cross some comfort zones to share the gospel with somebody. We gotta be willing to cross a room, shake a hand, learn a name, begin a relationship. And then B, to offer life, you must do life together. You gotta become friends and build relationships with people that don't know Jesus. That's what Jesus did. Here he speaks to this woman and this Samaritan, this happens to be a Samaritan woman. And how do you do life together with an unbeliever? Two things that we re learn from Jesus. Number one, verse seven, ask for help. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Jesus, who is the well of life himself, asks this woman for a, a cup of water. Now, he's the son of God. I'm sure he could find some divine way to suck water out of that well. But humanly speaking, he didn't have what he needed. He didn't have a bucket and a rope, a means to get the water out of the well, humanly speaking. And so what does he do? He submits to this woman's ability and begins a relationship. And she draws water out for him. So many of us have become so arrogant as, as Christians, and we think that as a Christian, sharing our faith with a non-Christian, that somehow we have to have all the answers, or that we need to be smarter than them, or that we don't need to ask them for anything, we need to be the one that's always provided, that's always the one that's more powerful. That's arrogant. Listen, I have something to offer an unbelieving friend, and that is Jesus. But I don't know of many unbelieving friends that I've had that didn't have something to offer me. They, they had some experiences that outstripped out, uh, my experience on something. They had a knowledge base that I didn't, or they had some experience on something. I got all kinds of unbelieving friends that know how to do things that I have need of, and, and so I go to them and say, hey, could you teach me this? And what am I doing? I'm submitting, I'm being humble to them, and, and letting them give something to me. 
That's how relationships go. Most people don't want to enter into a relationship that they can't contribute to. And so when you, it, stop, stop being arrogant or thinking that because you're a Christian, you've got to have all the answers. That's malarkey. Let's be the kind of Christians that go and just say, hey, I'm just a, I'm just a Christian, but I have something that I can share. But other people have something they can share with me, and it probably it would make them feel good to share them with me, and then I'd probably have more of an opportunity to share with them. And that's the second thing that we do, is not only, one, ask for help, but two, offer help. And that's what Jesus does in, does in verse 10. He says, if you'd ask uh, for, uh, if you asked me for living water, I'd give you living water. I'd give you something, the spiritual gift that I have to give. So we need to have something to give, that's Jesus, but we need to be willing to let others give to us and to be willing to humble ourselves and learn from unbelievers as well. Did you know that even unbelievers, sometimes unbelievers can even share, can teach you something about relationships, <laughs> can teach you about, there's all kinds of knowledge out there that you might not have that they do, and you can learn and you can grow from them, but you gotta be humble. And then that really leads us to, uh, see, you gotta talk about spiritual matters. If you're going to lead someone to Christ, if you're going to talk to them about Jesus, you're going to have to talk about spiritual matters. And this is where a lot of people get really, really nervous. They, they, they think, oh my goodness, I, I, nobody wants to talk about spiritual matters. And, and if I bring up spiritual matters, I'm going to get shut down in the conversation. You know, you might. But did you know that most people would be willing to engage with you about talking about spiritual beliefs, even if they disagreed with you? I learned that this week. An evangelism professor um, uh, taught me this. A survey had recently been done uh, asking the question, would you be willing to engage in a spiritual conversations about spiritual beliefs uh, with someone uh, even if you disagreed with them about uh, their faith or their belief? 78% of people said, yes, I would be willing to have a spiritual conversation like that. That means about eight out of 10, most likely, people around you, if you brought up in a natural way, spiritual conversations or asked about their beliefs or talked about yours, as long as you're not real pushy about it and everything else, the fact is they'd be willing to talk to you about that. Most people are open, they're interested in those kind of conversations. But when you share about Jesus, there is a certain posture that you ought to have. Let me help you with these principles. First of all, you need to be humble. Now, we just mentioned that. Evangelical Christians have earned a bad rap at this point. Too many think they're supposed to have all the answers. But Jesus comes to this woman and says, give me a drink. In other words, I have need of your help. He humbled himself. He, the son of the living God, humbled himself before a Samaritan woman. When we speak to others about our faith, humility must rule the day. Don't act like we have it all together or that we know all the answers. See, a lot of you don't share your faith in Christ because you're afraid that they might ask a question that you don't have the answer for. And to which I say, and I hope you remember me saying this, I say, who cares if you don't know the answer? Why don't you just, the answer be, if you don't know the answer to their faith question or you get stumped, why don't you just be honest and say, wow, you stumped me. I don't know the answer to that. But I'm gonna, you got my curiosity, I'm gonna think that through. I might even go and ask somebody that might know. I might read my Bible a little bit more, and if I come up with an answer, I'll tell you, if I find it's a mystery to me, I'll be honest with you about that too. Why don't you just take all the pressure off and just go, you know what, I don't have to know it all all the time. See, a lot of us, we put way too much pressure on ourselves about this. God doesn't expect us to, you can only give what you have. You say, well, all I really know is what Jesus did in my life. So share that. Share that. And see what God can do. And you say, well, I might bumble it up. I may get it all confused. I might say it wrong. Well, you know, God can still hit straight legs with crooked sticks. Trust the Lord. Be at peace. God can use it. And you can always learn more. In fact, I grow in my faith most when I talk to somebody who challenges my faith the most and has questions I don't have good answers for, because it makes me go back and take a look at my faith, take a look, and, and then I go, wow, there are answers. And then I have a stronger faith, and then my experience with Jesus becomes richer. Why? Because I was interacting with somebody, and, and, and I had to be humble and realize I didn't have it all together about something. Number one, be humble. Number two, spark interest. In verse 10, Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked for you, ask, 
uh, you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What was he doing? He was sparking your curiosity. He said, well, you know, if you'd asked this, well, you could really get something amazing. And she's like, what? Huh? She was coming there for physical water. Now her interest is peaked for spiritual life. She's curious. What is this gift of God, she's thinking? Who's asking me for a drink? Who is this man? Your own life can spark curiosity in others. Where they start asking, why is Jesus so important to my friend? Uh, What makes this person so passionate about who God is? If we're following God passionately, we're gonna spark curiosity in other people's lives. If we ask questions, it can spark. I was on an airplane with a man uh, several months ago and, and uh, I, I asked him a question about his business. And then he told, talked about his business and how a bunch of things had come together. I knew he wasn't a believer. How a bunch of things had come together and it just seemed almost like this guiding hand was, and he kind of mentioned that. And I said, why do you think that is? And he said, oh, I don't really know, but I've been thinking about it. And I said, well, you know, I think I have the answer. I think I I do have an answer for that. Would you be interested? It piqued his interest. He said, yes. Well, then I had his permission to share with him what I believed about God and God's life towards him. The third thing that you do when you talk about spiritual matters is appeal to need. Jesus did that. He talked about thirst, and we all thirst for something. We all thirst for something higher. We have a great need of eternal life and a confidence. Everybody around you has needs, and Jesus is the one that can meet those needs and address those needs. Somebody has a need for a relationship. You can talk about that. Say, you know what? We all do have a need for a relationship, and I really believe that the greatest relationship that we have need for is a relationship with God. Somebody might say, well, you know, I really have a a, a need for hope. You know, I've found that Jesus provides hope for me, and he can meet your need of hope as well. We need to appeal to need. Fourth, we need to make room for conviction. Make room for conviction. Notice what Jesus says in verse 15. He's, the, the Bible says, the woman says, sir, give me this water. I want this water. And Jesus says, go call your husband and come back. And what does she say? I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right when you say you don't have a husband. In fact, You've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What is he saying? He's saying, yeah, you've had a whole bunch of men that have been your husbands, and because of moral failing, this is basically what he's saying, because of moral failing, all those marriages are over with. Now you're shacking up with a guy, and you're in sin over that as well. And so what is he saying here? He, notice how he said it. First of all, he didn't point his finger. He didn't shame this woman but he also didn't hide from the fact that sin was in her life. He was honest about that without being condemning to her, but then he backed off and allowed the Holy Spirit to come and convict her of her, knee, of her sinfulness, and her, especially in face of, of his holiness. And you know, when we talk about sin, the sin that separates us from Christ, when we talk about that when in our spiritual conversations, we need to acknowledge, and what's great is we can do something that Jesus didn't do, and that is, we can actually say, hey, I've sinned. And Jesus has forgiven my sin. Jesus couldn't say that. He never sinned, never did, never will. But we can say, listen, I have sinned and I have need for Jesus. And we can start with ourselves. We can point to ourselves before we point to our friend. But then at the same time, we can be very honest and you've sinned too. And my sin and your sin separate us from God. But in Christ, we can be brought near to God and our sins can be forgiven. So we acknowledge the sin, but we don't have to go to the place where we're condemning somebody else, but we don't hide from the fact, and we still call a sin a sin, and we let the Holy Spirit uh, do a work in our friend's life. And then fifth, don't get sidetracked. Jesus didn't get sidetracked. We see in verses 20 through 24, uh, the Bible says that, uh, that this woman started bringing up issues of religious denominations and religious differences. And Jesus didn't want to have a conversation about that. He wanted to have a conversation about himself, about about how she needed Jesus in his life. 
You see, we could be so tempted in, into, into being sucked into a bunch of conversations spiritually about the difference between Catholics and Baptists and Methodists and Episcopalians and Lutherans and all of this stuff, and we can get so distracted by all that. Not that those conversations don't have value, but the fact is, is what we really need to talk about is Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done for us and how receiving Jesus means life to us. And so we need to keep the focus on Jesus when we're telling somebody about Christ and, and, and not allow other distractions to knock us off course. And then sixth and, and last is when we share or talk about spiritual matters, we need to present Christ as Savior. In verse 25 and following it says, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and Jesus says, I, speak, I who speak to you am he. He presented himself as the Savior of the world. We need to present him as the savior of the world. We need to win our spiritual conversation and say, you know what, Jesus is the son of God. He died on the cross for your sins, rose again to be your savior, and, and if you accept him in your life and turn from your sin and accept him, then your sins can be forgiven, he can be your Lord, and for all eternity, and bring you to God. We need to present him as savior and Lord, not as good teacher, not, not as just a, a good man, not as just this warm fuzzy, but as Lord a savior of our life and of the world. We need to present him as the son of the living God. And there's a promise attached to this. And this is something so important. There's a promise. God will take care of the outcome. Do you hear me? God will take care of the outcome. See, so many of you, you're afraid to share your faith in Christ to other people because you feel like it's up to you. I think one of the reasons is because preachers have often talked about going out and winning souls. Right? We use that term. You know, we're going to go out and soul win. And I don't, I don't despise that uh, statement at all, but it, it's given us a poor perspective. Because it, when you go out to win, you want to win. And when you don't get the result you're looking for, you feel like you've lost, right? Well, the fact is, is we're not, I, I don't know that I can ever win a soul. I can seek to persuade somebody. I can share the message of Christ with somebody. I'm responsible to do that, but I don't think I can. I, the Bible speaks of how the Holy Spirit has to draw someone to God the Father for them to be able to respond. You can't respond in faith unless God's doing a work in your life. So if that's true, then who's responsible? Uh, who's more responsible for uh, someone being one to Christ? You or the Holy Spirit? the Holy Spirit. Does that absolve you from a responsibility? Absolutely not. But what it does is it lifts off of you the burden of, 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 of creating some salvific result in somebody's life. The fact is, is that God wants me to share the good news of Jesus with everybody, but then to trust him with the results. That doesn't mean that if nobody comes to Christ when I share Christ that I don't kind of take a look at how I'm doing it. Maybe I need to. But the fact is, is I know that I'm gonna share Christ with some people and they're not gonna respond by becoming Christians when I share. And there's gonna be other people that are gonna respond and they're gonna accept Christ, but I really don't deserve much credit over it. You know, Jesus talks about, uh, in, the, in the parable of the sower, he talks about a farmer that represents somebody that's sharing the gospel going out and spreading seed everywhere. And, and what does he do? He spreads it everywhere. He takes the seed, it's perfect seed, and he spreads it everywhere. He doesn't just put it on good soil, he spreads it everywhere. And some lands on hard soil, some on, on fertile soil, and some kind of not so fertile soil. And so in some places, it has a response, but it gets choked out by weeds. In other places, it gets snatched up by the birds. And in other places, it roots in good soil, and it, it multiplies, and it grows, and it's wonderful. And see, what we've got to realize is that what is God calling us to do? He's calling us to spread the seed. Is he calling us to be worried about what seed falls on what soil? No. He says, listen, I have endless seed here. Keep tossing it, and it when it hits good soil, it'll hit good soil. Furthermore, we need to understand something that Jesus says here in, uh, in verse, we didn't read it earlier, in verses 34, or 35 and following, he says, do you not say four months more and then the harvest? 
I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. And the harvest of souls is what he's saying. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. He says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. What's that saying? That's saying when you go and share Christ with other people, it may be that for, for one time when you share Christ with somebody that you're not gonna see them come to Christ with you. But you're just planting a seed. But there might be some other time when you share Christ with somebody and they accept Christ right then and there. And you go, oh my goodness, how did that happen? And you start patting yourself on the back. Oh wow, I'm a good evangelist. Well, I'm pretty slick at this. I know, I know the answers, I know how to share Christ. Don't go patting yourself on the back. Because I bet you anything, I bet you anything that if you ask that person that just came to Christ when you share the gospel for the first time, if you ask them, have any, has anybody else shared Christ with you before? Have you been thinking about spiritual matters at all? Have you had anybody encourage you in this? I bet you anything they're gonna say, well, of course, yes. In fact, I've been feeling like God's been just dogging me with stuff. I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. So and so has had an influence in my life, and so and so. But when you shared it, it's like it all came together. It made sense right now, and so I accepted Jesus. So see, it wasn't all you anyway, right? So if it's not all you, when it works out that really God was orchestrating much, something much bigger involved, involving more people than you, then when it doesn't result in someone accepting Christ right then, why should you take the responsibility of that and feel like a failure? You're just part of a process that you don't even see how it all ties together yet. And you don't have to. Leave that to God. So what am I saying? I'm saying we need to share Christ. We need to be water carriers. We need to point people to the, the, the wellspring of life, Jesus Christ. We need to do it and do it and do it and do it over and over and over again in the lives of people. And you know what? We need to then not feel any pressure beyond that. And know that God's gonna take care of it. And if you can get that pressure off you, my, my friend, I bet you you're gonna share Christ more. So stop being so worried about failure and just relax and do what God calls us to do. And let's point to Jesus, who is the giver of life. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father God, Lord God, if there's somebody here today that needs Jesus, would you lead them and draw them to yourself to receive Christ as Savior and Lord and, and to uh, begin walking with him? And Father God, would you take all of us and make us like that woman at the well and send us out of this place going and sharing with everybody about what Jesus has done in our life and what he could do in theirs. Father God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would do something so profound and powerful in our lives. We thank you for, the, for your love, your grace, your, 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 your power, and, and your salvation in Jesus. And Lord God, we revel in that, we drink in that, and we wanna share that with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.